Uh, today we're with uh, Vasil uh, Yasinov, and um, we are going to be talking about his exciting new paper published with Giovanni Perry in the Spring 2019 Journal of Human Resources. Uh, uh, Vasil is a postdoc at Stanford's Immigration Policy Lab and a research affiliate at the IZA. He did his PhD at the University of California, Davis. Um, and this is JHR Threads. So uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you first become interested in economics? So um, I really didn't take a traditional way. So when I was, uh, so I was born in Bulgaria. I was born and raised in Bulgaria. Uh, up until high school, I, I studied there. So upon completing high school in Bulgaria, I moved to, to California uh, precisely to, to do my college, to study here. So I, I went to community college and then I transferred. I transferred to a four-year institution and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, so I, at that time, the, the kind of the default um, major was business. You don't know what to do. You study business administration because that's kind of broad and you can sort of narrow it down later on. Wow. Turns out the university that I was at, University of California, San Diego, did not have a business major. So the closest thing to, be, to business that we had was economics. So I said, okay, I'll enroll in economics. I didn't really know what that is, but, you know, it sounded cool. Um, so, and it turns out, as I started taking these upper division classes, I was completely fascinating, fascinated by, you know, how we can use um, mathematics and modeling and equations to actually analyze real world behavior of firms, individuals, um, countries, and so on. So that, that was completely new. All these frameworks were really fascinating, completely new to me. Um, so that's what I did. I applied for PhD programs. Um, I got into UC Davis. Um, and then turns out, it, as I studied economics further and further, maybe a similar experience, you had a similar experience, but I was, I was getting more fascinated by um, by the things that we study, by, by research topics that people do, by the kind of um, impact that, um, you know, research articles and theories and frameworks can have on, on real people. All right, let's talk about this exciting paper. This is one of the coolest papers I've read in a long time. I remember it was in a working paper. I was thinking what would be really nice is if you could just tell us what the heck this Mariel Boatlift even was. Why is it so special that it attracts people like David Card? George Borjas and yourself to study it. And if you could just kind of give us a big picture rundown of like where, you, what your paper is and sort of like, yeah. what, what, what it, where does it exist? Where does it fit? Well, okay, that's good. Yes. All right. So um, uh, the Mario Boat Lift of 1980 is a unique, a special episode in U.S. history. So why, why is it unique and special? And f well, first of all, what was it? So due to political turmoil in Cuba, Fidel Castro said, okay, I allow whoever wants to go to immigrate to the, to the United States, you're free, free to do so. You're not restricted by any kind of um, uh, boundaries. So, so this resulted in a large, unexpected and sudden, and also geographically concentrated inflow of Cubans to the United States and more specifically to Miami. Um, in terms of an inflow of workers, this is really a unique episode uh, in, the, in the US history. So that is taking into account the size and kind of the sudden nature of, of, of the episode. Then um, David Card early on, um, he recognized the potential of this episode and back in 1990, he published a paper analyzing the, the labor market impact. Uh, by, by this, I mean what happened to um, the workers in Miami before the boat lift, the, the native workers, what ha the low skilled native workers, what happened to them after the boat lift? Yeah. So David Carr in his 1990 study, he found, um, so he compared Miami with a group of arbitrarily chosen cities. And he said, you know, Mi comparing Miami to those similar cities, I don't find a difference. I don't find a large statistically significant difference um, in, in wages among low skilled Miamians. So then I was uh, with my advisor, we were thinking about, oh, wow, we have this, on the one hand, we have this huge, hugely important episode, which has been analyzed 25 years ago. On the other hand, we have this updated toolbox that we can use. So what we found was um, we, we basically confirmed the earlier findings of David Kurtz. So we used our new methodology um, 
and we found no statistical evidence for a significant difference, so for, I should say for a large significant difference in the wages of Miamians relative to other cities uh, after the boat lift that can be attributable to the, to the mayor boat lift. Um, so that, that's our main finding. Um, if you think about a simple supply and demand uh, model, an inflow of workers, which uh, was what the barrel boat lift was, will shift the supply curve so that the, the new equilibrium will have higher employment and lower wages. So you can have more people and more wages in a very simple model. Yeah. So what David Carr showed and why, and part of the reason this, his study was so influential is, is that he said, hey guys, look, um, we have this model, but uh, you know, in reality, it turns out the labor, labor markets may not operate, in, in, you know, by these simple uh, rules of this framework. So in rea reality, it's more complicated. Labor markets can adjust in different ways. Right. Um, and, you know, it's not as simple as drawing two lines and kind of moving one line, uh, uh, shifting a line up or down. Um, and yeah, so with this in mind, we we confirmed the previous study uh, yeah. by David Card, but an important no impact on wages, no impact on native unemployment. Yeah, no impact on wage, no large significant impact on wages. Right. So right. one one um, caveat though is um, which we didn't we did not know um, before um, these two studies came out is that the the amount of noise that's in the data is much larger than what David Card documented. Mm. So, um, in other words, we, we, we're not able to rule out small, you know, differences, yeah. you know, in, in the order of, of interesting itself, right? This was a gigantic labor supply shock. Exactly. Yeah. So and this you, was, so, you, so you, if it's only small yeah. effects, well, that's still, that's it, still unexpected. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think when people kind of like skim the paper or if they hear about it, I think what they might, here's, here's my impression of what they're going to think. Uh, David Card did uh, a regression-based study where he picked five cities to be controls, and there's not really any clear explanation in the footnotes about why he chose them, except he just says they're similar, you know, exactly. along some dimensions. Yeah. And you could say, well, uh, uh, you know, uh, Vasil and Giovanni, what they do is they do synthetic control. Right. And so like, but I actually feel like that's not the full picture of the study because one of the deeper things of the study is this uncovering of measurement error in these two data sets. And I was wondering, you know, and, and you do do synthetic control, but a lot of the, the, the hard work comes into just figuring out why Borjas might be finding what he finds, uh, and that has more to do with these data sets. So I wanted you to explain to me like I'm five, these two current population survey data sets. So when analyzing uh, this episode, the research is confronted with, between choosing two um, data sets. So they're both part of the current population survey, which I may use um, uh, uh, abbreviated as CPS, that stands for the current population survey. So there is the May and the May extracts of the current population survey, and then there is the March ones. So first of all, I should say, so CARD used the May. So May, I, I put this together with the so-called outgoing rotation groups, which are, which are I think, a, a part of, of a sort of survey respondents, which are um, uh, observed for a eight months and then taken out for four, mo four months, eight months, and then four months again, something like that. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, so the first choice that the uh, researcher has to make is, you know, which data set should I choose? Right. And so, so importantly, uh, David Card used the May uh, current population survey, and we'll discuss about why that was. But, you know, since David Card, many different um, studies and textbooks have kind of given um, this, this episode as an example, just like, you said you give it to your students uh, as an example of a policy evaluation exercise. So let's take Miami, let's take Los Angeles before 1980, after 1980, let's subtract and let's see what, what happened to wages. Right. So, so many textbooks have dug into that and to the best of our knowledge, they've all used the May, uh, the May um, extracts of the, of the CPS. 
That's what we were using originally, but then comes uh, George Borges, who was using the March CPS. Now, let's discuss what the differences are. So, uh, so first of all, importantly, the May CPS ha uh, has more people in it. Just as simple as that. So we call the sample size. So the sample size are large, is larger in the May. And here the statistical intuition that you can have in mind is the more people you have in your data, the less noise the data will have. Mm -hmm. And so we call this measurement error. You referred to this earlier, but you know, more uh, uh, informally, we can just call it noise. Right. So that's one. So May has more respondents, less noise. Second is, uh, May has, the May CPS contains data on your, I think, weekly wages. Yeah. So, so, and I think part of the responses are also asked about hourly wage. So, since we're analyzing low-skill labor markets and low-skill yeah. workers, uh, many of them are paid by the hour, as, as we all know. Yeah. Um, so, this is kind of a good measure. Uh, again, this is, talk, this is about noise. A, a decent measure of how much you earned in a specific week or specific month your week yeah. because that's how you're paid on the other hand the march cps um asks for your yearly wages so it tells you hey you're a low skilled construction worker how much did you make last year and then uh, we want to infer for kind of theoretical reasons and we're interested in um your hourly wage so what do you think is going on if it's not some rightward shift in this i mean it is a rightward shift in the labor supply curve but that model uh, appears that you know that equilibrium model doesn't appear to be the most useful one for this episode. So what the heck is going on? Well, I think it's just reality is more complicated. So I think you know people move, people upgrade their occupations, people upgrade their education. Um, firms uh, also adjust. Maybe I'll be hire, I'll hire more people. I'll open up another shop or another factory. It's just um, you know reality. The labor market is not just a simple two equation uh, kind of uh, totally. object. I have so many questions and so many. Th this is such a fascinating interview. But I know you have uh, a lot. You have a life. So um, <laughs> I uh, just wanted to thank you for uh, your work on this. It's uh, really uh, I think you know going back to what you said that you want to impact uh, people's lives. I think trying to understand, especially in 2019, you know, what exactly can we expect from Latin American migration is really uh, obviously a very timely and important study. And, um, and it's a very scientific study. And so I really appreciate you uh, giving me your time and talking to me about it. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. It's, it was a great pleasure.